Hi, so I've made a podcast on heart murmurs. Now this is something I really struggled to get my head around during year two and I hope that this video will help you guys understand it a little bit more. I have tried to make it interactive and tried to put in all of the components of the four typical heart murmurs that you're taught in medical school. This podcast will cover the normal heart sounds and some of its normal variations. Go over two pathological heart sounds, which are added sounds, S3 and S4. And then I'll go over the heart murmurs. So aortic stenosis, aortic regurg, mitral stenosis, mitral regurg, and then a congenital heart murmur, ventricular septal defect. Collectively, I talk about how to characterise the sound of a murmur and how that murmur is graded. And then individually, we go over the etiology, the pathophysiology, their main clinical findings, initial investigations and then their basic management. Starting with normal heart sounds, now this is composed of two sounds. First of all you have S1 and that is the lub and this is the sound of the closure of the AV valve, so your aortic and your pulmonary valve. Then you have S2 which is the dub and this is the closure of the semilunar valves, the mitral and the tricuspid valve. The phase of cardiac cycle that appears between S1 and S2 is systole, and then between S2 and S1 is diastole. So when you're examining a patient, it is good practice to palpate the carotid pulse whilst you're auscultating the pericordium. Now you're doing this so that you can determine which sound is S1. And this is the heart sound that coincides with the pulsation of the carotid pulse. In this podcast, I have put sound clips and some animations in, just so that you can get a feel of what you might hear on auscultation. So starting off, this is the sound of a normal heart. A normal variation of the heart sounds is split sounds, and this is when S2 is heard as two separate sounds. It is a normal and physiological heart sound, which is heard during inspiration, and it's due to the closure of the semilunar valves at a different time. So when we inspire, there is a drop in the interthoracic pressure, and this means that there's more blood returned to the right side of the heart. This increased pressure in the right ventricle will result in there being a delayed pulmonary valve closure. You can get a patient to exaggerate this by getting them to hold their breath on inspiration. So this isn't just a physiological heart sound, it can be pathological and it's heard in disorders such as atrial septal defect and some of the murmurs that I'll go on to talk about later and I'll flag up which murmurs that this is associated with. On auscultation, you're likely to hear something like this. The first pathological heart sound I'm going to talk about is S3. Now this is an added heart sound and it's a low frequency sound heard after S2. It is caused by rapid ventricular filling and it can be physiological in children or young healthy adults. However, if it is heard in the older population, then you might be thinking that there is a pathological cause to this. Something such as coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies or a valvular incompetency. And it sounds like this. You may have heard the term gallop rhythm when you've been reading about S3. Now a true gallop rhythm is when S3 is paired with tachycardia and this happens in heart failure. It sounds very similar to what I've just played you, just a little bit faster and this is due to the tachycardia. The second added heart sound is S4. Now this is a low frequency sound heard before S1 and it's a sign that there are stiff and non-compliant ventricles. This is rarely innocent and its pathological causes are coronary artery disease, hypertension, aortic and pulmonary stenosis. On auscultation you would hear this. Moving on to the main topic of this podcast, which is heart murmurs. Now, a murmur can be defined as the sound of blood flowing. In the heart, it is caused by either flowing through an abnormal heart valve, being forced through the heart quicker during tachycardia and is termed a flow murmur, or passing through a structural abnormality, such as a ventricular septal defect, which we'll touch on at the end of this podcast. 
The heart valve pathology can either be stenosis, where the valves are narrowed and restricted when opening, or incompetency, where the valves are leaky and cause regurgitation of blood against its flow. Now when you're listening to the pericordium and listening for those heart murmurs, you need to think of five factors when you're describing that murmur in your presentations. So first of all, timing. So when was that murmur heard in the cardiac cycle? Was it heard during systole or diastole? Then next is duration. So in these cardiac cycles, was it early, late or throughout the systolic or diastolic phase? Then the location. So where did you hear the murmur best on the pericordium? Was it in place of the aortic valve or the tricuspid valve? And radiation. So does the murmur radiate anywhere? When you're listening for aortic stenosis, you want to listen to the carotid to see if it radiates towards there. And when you're listening to mitral regurg, you want to listen into the left axilla to see if it regurgitates towards the left axilla. And lastly, you need to talk about the intensity of that murmur. And this is graded between 1 to 6, 1 being it was heard by an expert in optimal conditions, and 6 being it was extremely loud and heard without a stethoscope. For each murmur, I have tried to put everything onto one page so that you can pause the video, take a screenshot, and then you can incorporate it into your own notes. So I'm going to start with aortic stenosis because this is the most common valvular disease in Europe and the USA and it's the second most frequent cause for cardiac surgery. Now patients are tend to be in their 70s and 80s and this is because the most common cause is genital changes and that accounts for 80%. There are some risk factors that are, go with this such as smoking, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, CKD and elevated CRP. Younger patients tend to present with a congenital bicuspid aortic valve and this has the same pathophysiology as degenerative changes and it just occurs a little bit earlier. And this is more common in patients who have coarctation of the aorta and Turner's syndrome. So in terms of the pathophysiology, the valvular endocardium is damaged as a result of abnormal blood flow across the valve. The endocardial injury initiates an inflammatory process and similar to atherosclerosis, this ultimately leads to the deposition of calcium on the valve. Calcification occurs slowly and is subclinical until the disease is fairly advanced. Progressive calcium deposition limits the aortic valve's mobility and eventually produces stenosis. So this restricts the forward flow of the blood out of the heart and it causes an increased pressure within the left ventricle which results in the development of left ventricular hypertrophy. This is because the heart muscle must increase its contractile force in order to overcome the narrow and restricted exit at the level of the aortic valve. Left ventricular hypertrophy is a pathophysiological adaptation. And as the stenosis worsens, this adaptive mechanism fails and the left ventricular wall stress increases. The systolic function declines as the wall stress increases and eventually the heart will fail. When a patient comes to you, they may say that they have a triad of symptoms and this typically is fatigue and syncope, dyspnea and palpitations or chest pain. Now they get the fatigue and syncope because they might be an arrhythmia or a postural hypertension which is happening in relation to the aortic stenosis. They have the sensation of shortness of breath because the left heart can't keep up with its demands when there is an increased cardiac output. And they have the palpitations or chest pain because the coronary blood flow isn't sufficient for the increase in left ventricular muscle mass. On examination, you might see that they have a slow rising pulse and a low blood pressure. And on auscultation, you will hear an ejection systolic murmur, which can also be described as a crescendo-decrescendo pattern that peaks in the mid-systolic cardiac phase. And this is heard best on the right upper sternal border. Using the bell of the stethoscope, you want to listen over the carotid pulses. And here you're seeing if there's any radiation of that murmur. Here is a sound clip of aortic stenosis. The initial investigations that we're going to carry out is an ECG, chest x-ray and an echocardiogram. Now this is the same for every single murmur. And some specialist tests that might be carried out is a cardiac MRI, cardiac 
catheterization or an ECG exercise testing. Specifically to aortic stenosis, the ECG is abnormal in more than 90% of patients and you'll commonly see a left ventricular hypertrophy or a left ventricular strain. A chest x-ray may show that there's cardiac enlargement or the presence of aortic valve calcification if it is severe. Now an echocardiogram is diagnostic and this shows the degree of the valve calcification, the ventricle function and the wall thickness. Asymptomatic patients will undergo an ECG exercise stress test. Now this is good for risk stratification for the development of symptoms and the need for future surgery. It is defined positive when there is onset of symptoms, ST changes, an abnormal blood pressure response or a complex arrhythmia. The management of a patient with aortic stenosis will depend on a few factors. The presence or absence of symptoms, cardiac function and the severity of the stenosis and the patient's suitability for surgery or any surgical risk. The first line treatment for a patient who is symptomatic is an aortic valve replacement. However, during the wait for their surgery, if they have heart failure symptoms or if they're unsuitable for surgery, they'll be given to doxin, diuretics and ACE inhibitors. And they may also be given a maintenance drug for their sinus rhythm. Asymptomatic patients are only offered an aortic valve replacement if they have got reduced left ventricle ejection fraction or are undergoing other cardiac surgery. For those patients who are asymptomatic and have mild or moderate aortic stenosis, they will undergo a follow-up regularly and this varies between six monthly to five years depending on their severity. At these appointments they will have a clinical examination and an echocardiogram to assess the severity of their symptoms and the severity of the aortic stenosis presentations and this is unlike the stenotic valvular disease which take many years to occur. So some of the causes are rheumatic valvular disease and this is the most common in developing countries, congenital bicuspid valves, aortic root dilation which occurs in Marfan syndrome and ankylosing spondylitis and then endocarditis can cause rupture of the valve leaflets. Now in terms of its pathophysiology, like I've said, it can occur acutely or chronically. So in acute aortic regurgitation, this is a medical emergency with high mortality and it results in an acute rise in left atrial pressure, pulmonary edema and then a cardiogenic shock. So during an acute aortic regurgitation, the end diastolic pressure in the left ventricle rises sharply. The heart tries to compensate by increasing the heart rate and increasing the contractility to keep up with this increased preload. But this is insufficient to maintain the normal stroke volume and fails, leading to the pulmonary edema and the cardiogenic shock. In the chronic progressive aortic regurgitation, this results in left ventricular volume and pressure overload because there is leakage of the aortic valve causing backflow of the blood into the left ventricle. This causes an increase in wall tension and to compensate this the heart wall undergoes hypertrophy. The end diastolic pressure remains normal due to the increased ventricular compliance resulting from the increased cavity size. However, eventually the left ventricular systolic dysfunction supervenes and the left ventricular end diastolic pressure rises resulting in a symptomatic congestive heart failure. I'm just going to take a moment here to go over the pathophysiology of rheumatic fever and the rheumatic valvular disease. So this is an inflammatory condition caused by an autoimmune process. When exposed to certain group A streptococcal infections, some individuals develop antibodies which cross-react with cardiac tissue. These antibodies cause a pancarditis involving inflammation of all layers of the heart. This causes acute illness associated with rheumatic or joint pains and skin rashes. The classic skin rash is erythema marginatum. During the inflammation, there may be acute injury to the valves and mitral and aortic incompetency may occur. Later with healing, the valves are distorted and subsequent stenosis occurs, more commonly involving the mitral valve rather than the aortic valve. So going back to aortic regurgitation and talking about the clinical features, 
A patient with acute aortic regurgitation may come to you with dyspnea, pallor, muscle extremities, rapid or faint peripheral pulses, basal lung crepitations, an altered mental state, decreased urine output, cyanosis and tachyipnea. So they're looking pretty shocked. However, in a chronic aortic regurgitation, they may have features of congestive heart failure, so dyspnea, fatigue, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, pink frothy sputum, wheeze, basal lung crepitations, and they may have a raised JVP. Some specific things that you might see on examination are some of the signs that are talked about in the books. So this could be a Corrigan sign, and this is a water hammer collapsing pulse. And this is when the arterial pulse shows a rapid rise and a quick collapse resulting in a wide pulse pressure, typically more than 50 millimeters per mercury. So to elicit this, you first ensure the patient has no shoulder pain. You palpate the radial pulse with your hand wrapped around the wrist. Raise the arm above the head briskly and you're feeling for a tapping impulse through the muscle bulk of the arm as the blood empties the arm very quickly in diastole, resulting in a palpable sensation. Demut's sign is when a patient's head bobs in each time of each heartbeat. And Quink's sign is when there's no capillary pulsation due to a large stroke volume. Now these are both peripheral hemodynamic signs associated with a bounding pulse and systolic hypertension of chronic severe aortic regurgitation. On auscultation, you're going to hear a decrescendo diastolic murmur, which is heard best at the upper left sternal edge in the tricuspid auscultation area. And this is what it sounds like. The investigations that are run for aortic regurgitation are similar to aortic stenosis. So on an ECG in an acute patient, you may see some non-specific ST T wave changes plus a sinus tachycardia. However, in a chronic presentation, you might see a left axis deviation and left ventricular hypertrophy, but there might also be some ischemic changes too. A chest x-ray on a chronic patient might show signs of cardiac enlargement, and you may also see some pulmonary edema. And the echocardiogram again is diagnostic, and we're evaluating the severity and potentially the etiology of the aortic regurgitation. Management-wise, again, is split into medical and surgical. Now, for an acute patient, we're going to stabilise them first with inotropes, vasodilators, and then we're going to do an urgent aortic valve replacement or repair. In chronic patients, if they're asymptomatic, they will be given reassurance, and if they have a normal left ventricular ejection fraction, they will be seen yearly for a routine echocardiogram. However, if they have an injection fraction less than 50% or they are symptomatic, then they will be given an aortic valve replacement or repair. If they are a non-surgical candidate, then they may be offered a vasodilator therapy or a transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Moving on to mitral stenosis, now 95% of the cause comes from rheumatic valve disease, which we discussed in the previous slide, and the rest is made up for, of the congenital de deformity. Now, in terms of its pathophysiology, in mitral stenosis, the mitral valve opening is restricted due to the thickening and fusion of the leaflets. This impedes the forward flow of the blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle. To compensate for this, pressure in the left atrium rises. This impedes forward flow of the blood from the lungs, which becomes congested. Now, eventually, the left atrium dilates due to the chronic pressure and the volume overload. The blood pressure in the lung vasculature rises, which is called pulmonary arterial hypertension. With a higher pulmonary artery pressure, the increase of pulmonary vascular resistance, the right ventricle has to work harder to continue to pump blood through the lung vasculature. This causes the right ventricle to initially hypertrophy and then dilate. Back pressure from the right ventricle eventually causes tricuspid regurgitation and escalating right arterial pressure. So patients presenting with mitral stenosis are typically going to present with features of congestive heart failure. So these are things like dyspnea, fatigue, hemoptysis, which is pink frothy sputum, or chest pain. On examination, you might see that they have a malar flush, and this is a plum red discoloration to the high cheeks, which is classically associated with mitral stenosis. They may have atrial fibrillation, a tapping apex beat, 
On auscultation, you will hear a diastolic decrescendo murmur occurring after an opening snap. Now, this opening snap is the sound of the stiff, non-compliant valves opening. You may also hear a loud P2 component to the S2 sound, and this is a sign that there is pulmonary hypertension. And you also will listen to the lung bases to see whether there's any pulmonary edema due to that pulmonary hypertension. So again, here is a sound clip of mitral stenosis. The investigations that we've run will be exactly the same. So on an ECG, you might see atrial fibrillation, left atrial enlargement, or a right ventricular hypertrophy. On chest x-ray, you may see cardiac enlargement, interstitial edema, and prominent pulmonary vasculature. And again, the echo is diagnostic, quantifying the severity of the mitral stenosis and also maybe determining the etiology. In terms of management, if they are asymptomatic, then there's no therapy required. However, if they are symptomatic, then you might consider medical treatment first. So stuff like diuretics, long-acting nitrates, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, heart rate controls for those with AF. And then if they have a poor ejection fraction, then we want to think about the surgical treatments such as percutaneous mitral valve repair or replacement. The follow-up is once a year and again they have an echocardiogram and a clinical assessment to evaluate the changes in symptoms and to determine if there's any pulmonary hypertension developing and the need for medical or surgical treatment. Mitral regurgitation, like aortic regurgitation, can present in either acute or chronic presentations. And the causes for both are similar. So you can have infective endocarditis, ischemic papillary muscle dysfunction or rupture, acute rheumatic fever or rheumatic valvular disease, and acute dilation of the left ventricle due to myocarditis or ischemia. Now, in terms of its pathophysiology, the mitral valve leaks, making it ineffective due to bidirectional blood flow. The blood is ejected into the aorta as the left ventricle contracts, but it's also ejected backwards through the incompetent mitral valve. This eventually causes left atrial dilation. If the incompetency is severe, it causes a high left atrial pressure, which in turn transmits backwards into the pulmonary circulation, causing pulmonary venous and later pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is in turn results in right ventricular and right atrial hypertrophy and dilatation. Severe mitral incompetency can also cause a volume overload in the left ventricle, which results in left ventricular hypertrophy and later dilation. Now, a patient with this will complain of dyspnea on exertion, peripheral edema, palpitations, and maybe fatigue. And an acute presentation will be that of similar to aortic regurgitation. On examination, you might feel that they have an atrial fibrillation, a displaced thrusting apex due to the volume overload, and on auscultation, you will hear a pansystolic murmur, and this will radiate into the left axilla. There might be left ventricular failure, so you might hear an S3 added heart sound, or pulmonary edema as bibasal crackles. There might also be pulmonary hypertension, where you'll feel a right ventricular heave, or a loud P2 component to the S2 on auscultation. And this is what it will sound like. On the ECG, you may see a broad P wave of left atrial enlargement, or you may see an underlying arrhythmia and or current or previous infarction. Chest x-ray, you may see a cardiac enlargement. And an echo, again, is going to be diagnostic. However, this one is going to be a transesophageal echo, as this is better for viewing the left atrium. In terms of management, acute mitral regurgitation, the patient needs to be stabilised first. This may be by nitrates, diuretics and positive inotrope agents. And then they'll, they'll go for surgery where they'll have either a valve replacement or repair. In chronic mitral regurgitation, asymptomatic patients may be put on ACE inhibitors and beta blockers.
However, if they have an ejection fraction less than 60%, like symptomatic patients, they will be offered a valve replacement or repair. Asymptomatic patients are monitored closely and they are assessed for any risk factors such as hypertension. So I've chosen to go over ventricular septal defects as these are among the most common congenital heart defects in infants and children. Now congenital is the most common cause and it happens in families with strong history of congenital cardiac malformations and the incidence of VSD is increasing. There is certain genetic abnormalities which have a higher incidence of the association with VSD and the most common being Down syndrome. However, a ventricular septal defect can also be an acquired feature and it is rare cases of acute myocardial infarction. And it usually occurs two to five days after the infarction and is marked by the onset of acute left heart failure, chest pain and low cardiac output and shock. So in terms of pathophysiology, all VSDs are essentially the same regardless of their location. The two factors determining their hemodynamic effects of a VSD is the size of the defect and the pulmonary vascular resistance. So the larger the defect, the greater the effect it has. So I'm just going to focus on how infants and children present with a ventricular septal defect. If the defect is small, then they tend to not have any symptoms. However, if it's moderate to large, the symptoms generally appear by the age of five to six weeks. They may come with failure to thrive, and this is because they're getting exercise intolerance. Now, the only exercise a five to six year old infant is getting is feeding. And this tends to slow down and is often associated with tachypnea and increased respiratory effort. So they're not going to get as much nutrients as they need, resulting in the failure to thrive. On auscultation, you're going to hear a loud pan-systolic murmur. And you may also hear a loud P2 component to the S2. There'll be radiation to the right sternal edge. And you might also feel an enhanced apical pulsation or a parasternal heave. So here, this is what it sounds like. The ECG may be normal in a small defect, but however, as the defect gets bigger, there's more signs on the ECG. So you might see a left ventricular hypertrophy or even a biventricular hypertrophy if it's a severe defect. A chest x-ray, you may have a cardiac enlargement. And the echocardiogram, again, is diagnostic. Now, this can be used to quantify the severity of the defect and also used to follow up patients with the smaller VSDs. In terms of management, if it's a small defect, then they may need observation and annual clinical follow-up with the echocardiogram. However, if it's medium to large, they will need a corrective closure. And this is the same for acquired ventricular septal defect. They will need that corrective closure. Now just to recap what this podcast has gone over, so we first off started looking at the normal heart sounds and its normal variations. I then went over two pathological added heart sounds and then five heart murmurs which are taught in medical school. So aortic stenosis, aortic regurg, mitral stenosis, mitral regurg and then a congenital heart murmur of ventricular septal defect. And for each of these murmurs I talked about the etiology, its pathophysiology, how we characterise and grade them, their main clinical findings and their basic investigations and management. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and I also hope it helps with your revision. And like I said at the start of the aortic stenosis clip, with each of the um, murmurs, you can pause the video, take a screenshot and then add it into your notes. Thank you ever so much for listening.